Aloha. I'm Karina Lyons, Vice President and Director of Research at the East West Center and host of East West Center Insights. The center is a cutting edge research and capacity building institution, and we're based right here in Hawaii. And our mission is to forge a deeper understanding and connection between the East and the West. So every two weeks here on the show, at Tuesday at 2 p.m. Hawaii time, I have a conversation with an East West Center expert or a guest from our global network, and we talk about critical issues to the Asia Pacific region. So check us out at eastwestcenter.org slash insights. Uh, so today our guest is Dr. Sang Hop Lee, and he's a senior fellow at the East West Center and professor and chair of the economics department at the Univers University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, Sang Hop, he earned his PhD from Michigan State University and his master's from the national, oh, I, almost, I practice this, sorry Sang Hop, from the Seoul National University in Korea. Uh, his research focuses on population aging and social welfare issues. He has published numerous articles, including 11 books on uh, population aging and the labor market with an emphasis on South Korea and other economies in Asia. And so today we'll be talking about the impact of aging on Asian societies. So Stang Hop, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thank you for inviting me. So I should warn you, I'm not an economist and uh, that's gonna be apparent. So go easy on me today, okay? Yeah. <laughs> That's it, you're not gonna do that. All right, so what most people do actually know um, about uh, um, Asian societies is that it's, uh, they're aging rapidly. So could you please set the scene for us and tell us why these trends matter for uh, Asian futures? Okay, uh, yes, Asia is aging very fast. Uh, the share of the older population in Asia is rising very rapidly. And Asia is at the forefront of the global phenomenon of population aging. So by uh, 2036, 14% of the region's population will be older than 65. The share in 2012 was 7%, which means it takes less than 25 years in Asia for the share of the older people to double. So the transition took much longer in the other advanced economies. Uh, so it took 40 to 50 years in Germany and the UK. Mm -hmm and 70 years in the United States, 85 years in Sweden, and over 110 years in France. So however, wow. <laughs> it takes only 25 years for Asia to make the share of the older population double. <laughs> so population aging uh, matters so much for Asia in large part due, uh, due to the this speed and scale. You know, Asia is the most populated region of the world, accounting for 60% of the whole world population. So population aging is due to increasing life expectancy and declines in fertility. In some Asian countries, the fertility decline is so fast. It's just unprecedented. So, well, uh, the rise in life expectancy is a positive development. You know, everybody actually wants to live longer. <laughs> and also rapid de demographic transition can also lead to rapid economic growth. Mm -hmm. However, very rapid population aging can pose a serious threat to many economies, which are already mm -hmm losing uh, economic vitality. Right. Um, yeah, and Asian countries have some advantages and disadvantages. Um, the disadvantages are many developing Asian economies do not have a, uh, like a fully developed pension or healthcare systems, which provide the economic and the health security to the elderly. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and the, the biggest advantage for Asia actually is the, you know, uh, the two sides of the same token that it's still easier to develop and change mm -hmm. the public systems than in Europe or, or US. Because in Europe or US, the, the vested interest around the status quo has often been a major obstacle to any policy adjustment. So right. it was, yeah, I mean, this is, a, I mean, there are many advantages, but I think this kind of, a, you know, a, a easiness uh, to change the system and develop the system is the biggest advantage. Okay, so, so the, the, gosh, there's a lot in that, and you mentioned a lot of challenges, but what are some of the main demographic challenges for aging societies in Asia? So you, men you mentioned facility um, issues and, uh, you know, a whole bunch of stuff, but um, for somebody who's not a subject matter expert, for example, mm -hmm. what, is, like, what are the sort of the main, the top three main challenges facing Asian economies All because right. of aging? Uh, so, uh, aging populations present the fundamental challenges to policymakers. Mm -hmm. uh, one is how to develop systems that provide the economic security to the elderly. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, how to sustain strong economic growth. 
So this is this actually is a seemingly a conflict, right? In, in, uh, so you know, because older people uh, consume much more than they produce, but at the same, so you actually want to provide economic security to the elderly. But mm -hmm. how can you sustain strong economic growth? Because strong economic growth actually needs, uh, I mean, high skilled, uh, more younger people. So these are the major challenges that uh, Asia right. has. And the uh, other countries, like uh, you know, the advanced countries, more rich when they get old. But uh, Asia is getting old before they get rich, except right. for so that's the major, major challenges. Yeah, I've read that quite a lot. And so what, what's the answer? What are some of your policy recommendations for uh, decision makers in these countries? Oh, okay, this is a, a this is really <laughs> <good>. <laughs> uh, uh, As I mentioned, because on average, workers produce uh, much more than children or older people, you know, having a lot of workers in the population can increase the nation's production, increase the savings and lead to higher investment in health and education, which in turn will result in higher productivity. But in, uh, as they get older, uh, the proportion of the population at working age is already started to decline in many countries. And the older population is increasing rapidly. So the trend toward the population aging implies that each worker will have to support more and more retirees, both within families and under public pension and healthcare systems. So uh, there are several policy options. Uh, let me just uh, name four today, because um, okay. we have a limited time. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is to increase uh, contribution by workers. Mm -hmm. So we need to bring older people who are not working or unemployed back into the labor market. Okay. And you, yeah, yes, and utilizing women's workforce is equally important as the labor force participation of women in Asia is uh, generally lower than their, uh, those of men. Uh, and uh, promoting investment in human capital to make workers more productive is another way of increasing contribution by workers. So again, the number is we have to increase the contribution by workers in, you know, in terms of uh, numbers and also in terms of productivity. Okay, uh, so just, to, just to, to give people context then, so you mentioned women in particular, but are there any other groups in society that you're thinking of when you're, when you're suggesting to policymakers that we increase uh, the, um, the uh, productivity rates? Right, so promoting investment in human capital for children is also very important. Uh, but in terms of like, uh, you know, the policy priority, I mean, this is what many people say is uh, we have to bring older people. And also, especially in Asia, uh, the women's labor force participation rate is uh, quite low in, in many countries. So we have to, that's actually two priority. But uh, you are right. I mean, promoting investment in human capital for children is important. but. Promoting uh, investment in human capital is, uh, is important for any countries, not just for Asian countries. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm saying. You know, what is most important in terms of uh, aging society? So we have to increase the contribution by workers, which uh, target older people and also utilizing women's workforce. Okay, I feel like you're putting me on notice, but right, that was that was policy recommendation number one. And what were, what were some of the other ones you had in mind? Okay, oh yeah, <laughs> not the area. Okay, second, we need to control the cost of aging. Uh, population okay. aging can be very costly to a nation. I mean, this is proven to be the case in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. So and here in Hawaii. Yeah, you know, everywhere in in the United States. I I don't think uh, the U.S. healthcare system or healthcare cost is uh, ideal. <laughs> right. Uh, European countries as well. So actually, that's the advantage in Asian countries because uh, still they are, they are, you know, cost of aging is uh, relatively low because uh, they haven't developed, uh, uh, you know, this public system, but it's rising very rapidly. And the third one is Asian countries need to improve public support for uh, seniors. So it sounds contradictory, but that's true. The public sector plays a much more modest role in Asia compared with the other countries with a similar income level. Okay. So this is, is a tricky part. The sound approach is to, uh, to maintain uh, economic growth and providing mm -hmm. economic security for the elderly. And uh, in Asia would be the right balance, right balance between promoting public support and savings. So, okay. so, so know, not just pensions also, a parallel effort to promote savings and like savings, savings of right. individuals. Okay. Right, right. That's, that's very important. And the, like I said, the, you know, intelligent put to people can learn, for, you know, from mistakes of what other people actually make. So uh, 
uh, they can learn from other countries' experiences. Some, some countries actually already went through and it's hard to change the system, but they are mm -hmm. starting, they are developing the system. So they should find the right, right balance between you know, public support and service. Okay. Uh, last is, uh, I mean, there are many items, uh, I mean, uh, many things, but you know, like just the last item, uh, policy is that Asia needs to improve gender work life balance. Actually, okay. Yeah. I like the sound of this. <laughs> yes. I'm listening. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I, well, actually, I, I mean, with my actually grandson right now, and I'm taking care over him, and I cook for lunch, but that's not enough. <laughs> 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 Fertility rate has dropped to, to very low levels in many Asian countries uh, because childbearing is a hard, uh, heavy burden for women who have children in Asia. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I can probably come back to this issue about gender issues later, but, but for this- Yeah, we'll definitely circle back because that that yeah. seems like there are, um, I'm fascinated to know why, and oh, I'm yeah, sure there's yeah. more right. than one one reason. Right. Uh, but right at the beginning, you also touched on some, uh, some of the positive aspects of um, uh, demographic trends. Uh, and uh, something I've read about recently is this idea of a demographic dividend. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that. Oh, yes. <laughs> so population change can lead to uh, very different outcomes. Uh, because a Asia is very heterogeneous. That means uh, some countries are uh, still developing, some countries are advanced. But in developing Asian countries, the young working age population is uh, still going, like India, mm -hmm. Indonesia. So which can have a very direct and favorable impact on economic growth, uh, leading to so-called uh, demographic dividend because uh, Again, workers, young workers produce uh, more than children or older people uh, through their labor. So this is a more like a quantitative effect, but there are many other definitions of demographic dividend. For example, uh, like a trade-off. Uh, the one convincing argument to why the number of children, the fertility dropped so much in Asia is that there is a trade-off between the number of children and the uh, uh, investment on children like education. So uh, like my mom had nine siblings and uh, they are not you know, very well educated, uh, my, my grandma as well, but I have only one sibling and uh, we went to college and have a PhD too. <laughs> so right. Asia is a success story often resulted from this uh, high investment in education. So this is another part of uh, demographic dividends. So during the demographic transition, there is a large you know, bulk of uh, working population and also as the fertility declines, they invest on children. So uh, the best example might be like Korea, uh, you know, Japan, Taiwan, and the fertility actually declined. But the problem is that, uh, uh, you know, educating children is very expensive in some countries. So, I mean, due to private tutoring and rising competition among kids. So that's actually yeah, some problems. I mean, is there research to say that people are making such rational decisions about whether or not to have children? It's sort of astounding to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, actually, I don't know about. That. I mean, I, <laughs> you know, I for. I mean, I can just tell from my own experience. Uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, rational decision making or not. Uh, well, I, yeah, perhaps. I'm just but economists actually, economists assumes that you know we actually make uh, rational decisions. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm a political scientist, so I always. Um, that's my that's the first assumption that I question like why are humans making rational decisions goodness gracious so moving moving right along because that's a whole other show uh you also chair the executive council for the national transfer accounts project which is a title that tells me absolutely nothing about it so could you please tell us more about that project's work and scope okay okay so the national transfer accounts network or project in short we call it just the NTA was officially mm -hmm, the NTA yeah, NTA was officially launched in 2004 by Ron Lee at UC Berkeley and our own Andy Mason at the East West Center. So research teams, we started from uh, seven countries, but now the research teams in more than 90 countries are constructed. 90 countries? Yes. Wow. I didn't realize it was so large. Okay, <laughs> yes. sorry. Keep I mean, going. It's, it's so successful. I mean, so I thought, too, how come, I mean, in 16 years, uh, the 90 countries are constructing these accounts? Mm -hmm. So NTA produces a data which is a combination of economics and demography. So numbers in demography is like a headcount, fertility, mortality, 
changing age structure. This is the overhead count. But numbers in economics is like a single indicator, like uh, such as production, consumption, how much the nation produces, save, right? So the data we produce is the combination of these two, something like uh, how much older versus young people or male versus female produce, consume, and save. So as a result, uh, yeah, the data from the NTA can substantially improve our understanding of the how changing population age structure influence our economy. So this is a marriage between demographers and uh, economists, actually. <laughs> so we can actually talk about how, uh, what, what is the like, fiscal sustainability of uh, public finances in the future, okay. uh, what's the impact of population on economic growth, generational mm -hmm. equity, gender equity, and other important features of the economy. And right. also, yeah, the data was also uh, the designated as uh, uh, Korea's national official statistics uh, uh, last year. And Thailand is using the data for their national budget planning because uh, the Asian structure is uh, changing so rapidly. They want to know what would be the budget for elderly because uh, the government uh, program is uh, not Asian neutral. It's a targeted. Right. Program. Really? Asking, yeah. So NTA has a huge success in Africa as well because they use the data for indicators of uh, achieving sustainable development goals, you know, so-called SDGs. So right. Yeah. So uh, since 2004, we have provided the data and related research to world policymakers and researchers, of course, in key areas. So this is a, what I'm thinking is consistent with the idea of uh, evidence-based policy, which refers to the idea that policy decisions should be based on and informed by established evidence and data. So to summarize, right. I think, yeah, I think the network was, uh, has been successful, uh, very successful, because it provides uh, what researchers and policymakers need. And mm -hmm. also, uh, we have a very good organizational structure. I'm the chair of the executive council. Right, of course. We have, yeah, we have, yeah, we have executive council. We have uh, over 200 members, actually around the world. The NTA is decentralized by region, uh, you know, Euro, Americas, Asia, Africa. And uh, actually people are very nice, very collegial, so it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, a nice bunch of, econo of economists. I, uh, so 1,200 people, I mean, I, are they all um, economic researchers or are you working with governments? I, mean, I presume the value of this is that it's independent, right? Yes, so yes. how do you engage with the, with the statistics bureaus, for example? Oh, it's a, it's a very good question. So uh, uh, I gave a lot of actually online training, but uh, it's for, because I was the Asian regional team leader and uh, in, in Asia it's more actually centralized. Uh, so the, uh, there are a lot of help from many organizations like uh, UN Population Fund. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's called the APRO Asia Pacific Regional Office uh, located in Bangkok. So they have a very good network. So actually, uh, you know, they have a very good network with each government and states bureau. So, they actually contact me and you know, I also uh, collaborated with other people. So they say, oh, we need this training. We need to know. Uh, we, can you actually translate uh, your manual into uh, uh, Burmese, uh, Lao? So actually it's translated into many different languages, Lao. So right. I was, yeah, I was surprised. So that's the way, I mean, the, there is a regional uh, uh, center and the regional center has a, uh, their like headquarters. So those who help me help other people. So, yeah, that works. <laughs> that works. Yeah, I guess I'm just I'm really interested in the applicability of it. Uh, and um, uh, so you 90 countries are getting this data and um, you mentioned both Korea and Thailand, the, the governments are actually using this data to underpin some of their, their policy decisions because they're making like, clearly targeted decisions about um, budgetary decisions. Uh, but do, are you in all of the countries in Asia and uh, are you in any countries in the Pacific? Oh, okay. And then also, and sorry, Sankop, and then one last question about that. And if people were interested in procuring this, this research, uh, your findings, how could they uh, access it? Oh, okay. So uh, let me actually answer the second question first, because uh, it, it's in the public domain. So we actually put, put the, all the data sets. We have a very well developed uh, our, our uh, website, NTA, ntaoccoms.org. So we have a very good NTA.org. Okay. No, yep. NTA, ntaoccoms, N-T-A-C-C-O-U-N-T. So N-T-A-C-C, so ntaoccoms. 
because there are two okay. ways, NTA accounts that are NTA accounts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> NTA accounts so that are so if people or people can just search on Google National Transport Council, it leads to the website. So they can download the country data because we actually posted the country data. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, well, uh, Asia and Africa are two probably best examples which uh, uses, utilize this one for policymaking. Uh, the one thing is that uh, in some countries, like they're, they're like, uh, what is the they're like buzzword? What is the most important topic? Of mm -hmm. Then the, the peoples are different. Like in Latin America, they say inequality. Right. Asia, like aging and growth. So it's, mm -hmm. yes, so that's actually, we have kind of buzzword game, you know, this, what is the most important topic in your reason? So each country actually uses the data for different purposes. I don't have a kind of record for uh, how many times it, used, it was used because uh, they don't cite, you know, I realized that, oh, this is anti data, you know, in paper, oh, actually in research, I mean, in policy and research, you use this, but they just use it as kind of granted. So we are, the, we are donating the data set and the, or research and the providing the methodology as well. Right. Well, um, actually, before I forget, uh, I should congratulate you because the um, the, South, the, the South Korean president recently awarded you a presidential commendation, right? And it was for your substantial contribution to economic growth through statistical research and clearly your philanthropic contributions to research since people can access all your data for free. So can you tell us a little bit more about your work in South Korea and um, and maybe touch on how uh, rapid population aging has affected Korea's economy and, and society. Uh, uh, thank you for the compliment. Uh, <laughs> I began <laughs> it <laughs> embarrassing. I began it as a recognition. I know you're embarrassed. Sorry. I, I began it as a recognition of our research network as a whole. Okay. <laughs> so uh, population aging is such an important policy agenda in Korea. And it's my actually uh, one of my main topic, main country, you know, uh, study countries. So among OECD countries, Korea is uh, characterized by the lowest fertility rate. 0.9a last year, highest power rate among older people, and okay. also the highest labor force participation of older people. Uh, so people actually ask, uh, you are, you know, Korea. Okay, I'm you know, originally from Korea. <laughs> and uh, so how come, how can you reconcile this, uh, you know, this uh, numbers, right? So, you know, because of South Korea is so, so you can't advance them. So, but first of all, uh, however, I would like to mention that South Korea's economy and demographic transition is actually one of the success stories. The high poverty rate problem might again stems from the very rapid population aging, but I don't believe it will be a very long lasting permanent problem. So this is actually my research topic, what's going on and how can we you know, uh, uh, eliminate or alleviate this problem. Uh, Korea's older people used to rely a lot on traditional family support system and savings. So, okay. but, the, but the traditional family support system, meaning grown up children taking care of their older parents has been deteriorating. Uh, uh, and yeah, I don't think my kids actually take care of me anyway, but <laughs> and, low <laughs> interest, and low interest rates for the past 20 years, I mean, that asset income, like interest from savings is quite low. Mm -hmm. So it's changing, the support system is changing in Korea very rapidly. And public pensions also provide much less support to elderly Koreans than in any other developed countries. So only one third of our Korean retirees receive any pension at all because it's not matured. So uh, the pension system has been expanded rapidly, uh, but it's not able to catch up to the speed of population aging. Right. So of course, uh, I mean, older Koreans or any, any people any, in any country, they can work, older people can work more as they live longer and healthier. But surprisingly, uh, Koreans are um, pushed out of the, their career job very early at age, yeah, 50s uh, on average, well before the official retirement age. So they do not fully retire. They rather they take up temporary positions with little job security and low wages. Uh, for example, as building guards. Uh, thus, despite the relatively high employment rate, uh, 
very high, like more than 40% of South Koreans aged 65 and older, they, were, they are still living in relative poverty. In other words, although many older Koreans are working, more than four out of 10 people own less than the median income. So this is my research topic. I will continue to do this. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is a also fascinating country study case. It is, but it also, um, a, I mean, a real concern. And, and you've sort of talked about this a little bit right throughout the show, but are there any sort of overarching cultural challenges that prevent Ooh. countries like Japan, uh, Huge, Korea, yeah, <laughs> as a, yeah from yeah. addressing so, these issues? Uh, and then also, if you wouldn't mind, because I think we're kind of, we've got about five minutes left, if you could also touch on the role of, of women as a factor oh, in terms sure. of these yeah, challenges, but also the opportunities. Yeah. Okay, I spent two minutes for this. <laughs> no, so, no, no, no. Like, no, okay. we've, still got, we've got another five minutes. Op opening more borders and accepting more immigrants can be an effective policy tool to mitigate the negative impact of population aging, right? So, but in Korea and Japan, it seems politically more difficult than other countries due to national sentiment. Mm -hmm. So many Japanese and Korean uh, may not socially accept immigrants the same way as countries like the US and other European countries do. Uh, but because of such a rapid population aging, actually Japan started opening its borders much more uh, beginning last year. However, uh, if you look at the, the inside, the policy ch uh, change was controversial, even among their cabinet, because immigration- Japan, right. Japan, yeah, immigration has a long bit, uh, is so-called, you know, political third rail, really to controversial uh, debate. So uh, we did, even we did in the cabinet, they actually, uh, you know, in the beginning, there was huge debate. And there are other cultural challenges, as you mentioned. For example, in Korea and Japan, most births are uh, from marriage. So Korea has the lowest percentage of children born outside marriage among OECD countries, followed by Japan. So around the sorry, it's the low, sorry, can I, it's the lowest in all of the OECD of, countries. Lowest percentage wow. of children born outside marriage, yes. So about wow. only 2% in both countries. So this is an it's, instant. <laughs> but I'm, so why? Is it because it's such a Christian country or? So you ask the ch cultural challenge. So <laughs> cultures do change, but they are changing very yeah. slowly. It's like a one, uh, one ethnicity, one nation, you know, so these are culture. So it's a, like a European countries such as France, uh, they have like one half of births are outside the marriage. So it's not right. yet socially acceptable to have a children uh, born outside the marriage in Japan or Korea. So this is a huge hurdle. And also women in Japan or Korea bear most of the burden of child rearing, I already mentioned. So, and also the burden of caregiving to seniors for the heavily on daughters and daughters-in-law. So, yeah, this is a huge challenge, cultural challenge. Right. Uh, so I think we've got two minutes left, so I'm just going to ask you, you know, what's the answer? How do we change that? <laughs> and your wife's listening. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Uh, this is a very difficult question. How do you change it? Well, <laughs> actually, uh, it's not an issue in my house, my home. So, I mean, we have a very good uh, gender balance, um, work, uh, balance with work at home. So it's changing, um, there is, but historically, I mean, you know, first of all, it takes time, I think. Uh, I mean, it's uh, in other countries, it's uh, also there, they actually went through some kind of, uh, you know, uh, gender revolution. There is also uh, many uh, social welfare programs uh, which actually target women and take care of children. So they are developing. I think uh, it'll change. It's so, I mean, it's just so slow. So I said it's a cultural challenges. Uh, but policy is important. Uh, and also, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, probably so cliche, nothing is ever easy. And uh, uh, Asian policymakers face a number of difficult challenges, but of course, transparent government, political stability, and good leadership are extremely important as usual. So policy works. So that's my answer. I could not have said it better myself. And thank you for being such a trooper because that last question was a bit of a doozy and not and not directly relevant to your core research. So so thank you very much, Sankov. And thank you for your time today. And uh, that's all we have time for, but I feel like you and I have a lot of follow-up conversations. Uh, and um, I look forward to um, sharing this the links uh, that you referred to in terms of the National Transfer Accounts Project on our website. So thanks everybody for joining us at East West Center Insights today and we'll see you next time. Aloha. <laughs>